So the idea is to put one fifth part of the the the, the already infected um, mycelium in the coffee. Five, yeah. Five times, four times coffee for one time. Yeah. Okay. But there's a lot of. Uh, I was like, do you do you like um, do you have a mushroom farm to like produce mushrooms to eat them? Or what is the main issue? No, I'm only growing reishi. And I'm, gr I'm selling this for people that they can grow their own mushrooms. Reishi? Yeah. But reishi is also to eat them. No, it's a medical. It's a medicine. Medicine? Medicine, medicine. It's like plantas sangradas. No. It's a medicine? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, but no, it, it's not the medicine. Um, psychotropic is a medicine to kill cancer and all. It's ad adaptogenic medicine. Yes. Nice. And this is your flyer? Mm. It's the company. And, and this is what my, what Helia was growing in her kitchen, and this is what you're gonna grow over here. It's a simple box of uh, plastic box with holes and oh. micropore tape, what you buy from the pharmacy and it grows through the holes. Then mm. after and there's a coffee inside. And how do you dose? Yeah. Like how do you? But how many? Like polyspun kind of thing. Or? What material is the plastic thing? Mm. Is that normal plastic or poly yeah, like polyester? Yeah. Ah, like Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Helia brought the coffee from here, so I show you how to do it. And then you Can have you the. the oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you have the white box over there, so you can put the plastic on top and put some holes on the on the roof, and then you have somebody who sprays the walls and every nice. day. One time a day you spray with the water. walls, yeah, with the spray. Yeah, um, no, it's out, it's out, it's out. Yeah, yeah. But where should we keep it? Inside? No, there in the in the in the big box over there. Yeah, but located in the which, valley. Which box? In the the white box place. behind there. This is perfect. That's your question. Oh, yeah. But now you can, before it starts to produce the mushroom, you can keep them like anywhere, like over there, somewhere in the shade, it doesn't matter where you keep. But when they start to produce mushrooms, they need humidity. So when you spray the walls with the sprayer, then you have the humidity. And when you have the holes on the plastic, the tra uh, transparent plastic on top, then it gets the air. That's the only thing it needs. Then this this box, the police pan. The styrofoam, styrofoam <laughs> big box. Yeah. The police pan. Yeah, so it's that one. And then you need to make holes in this in this one, in this box. Yeah, but you don't even have to make when I show you like if you can you already have this like uh, plastic uh, like this but ten times bigger. I found five over there, so you don't even have to make uh, holes because you make holes in here, so they can grow out from here, and then when you see they're growing, then you put them in the box there and you spray the walls. Uh, Comprende? You spray the walls. So it keeps because uh, Helia was through those plastic through the story about the water evaporates through. No, it's the why you spray inside. Inside, 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 so it only has like it needs a moisture of ninety percent. Uh -huh. So if because Helia had them in his her kitchen, and the air is really dry in the winter in Finland, yeah. so it doesn't form like really good mushrooms. So. What we did is we put the plastic box, like a bag, around it, the box, so and we kept it moist, so then it grows better. So uh, I'm, now there's, I'm gonna teach you like uh, what kind of mushrooms there are in the world. So uh, most of the mushrooms are uh, saprophytic mushrooms, and this is like. Uh, the primary uh, decomposers in our planet. So they are the ones who are building the soils over here on planet on planet Earth. And most of the gourmet and medicinal mushrooms they belong to this type of mushroom, the saprophytic mushrooms. And they eat the, there's like the white rot rot mushrooms and the brown rot mushrooms. 
So the white rot mushrooms are eating the lingin in the wood. It's called lingin. And then the brown rot is eating the cellulose. Cellulose. So the uh, white rot is leaving the cellulose behind and the brown rot is leaving the lingin behind. What is lingin? Lignin. Uh, lignin, uh, sorry. Lignin, it's like a, one part of the wood, like one substance. There's the cellulose and the lignin. Uh, and then there's another not, another type of mushroom which is like very familiar to each of you. It's a mycorrhizal fungi. So the mycorrhizal fungi, uh, it's always like in touch with some plant. And uh, so like for example each tree in the forest has a own mycorrhizal fungi. So they increase the plant's ingestion of nutrients, nitrogen and essential components like phosphorus, copper and zinc. And this mycelium is then giving these nitrogens and uh, the tree is giving the sugars to the nitrogen. So it's a sy symbiosis. And the mycelium is also very clever. So it distributes the, the nutrition to the, the trees which are in shade. So it can, it can take from the big trees and distribute uh, it to the smaller ones which are in the, in the, in the shade. And these mushrooms are really hard to cultivate because they, they require four organisms uh, simultaneously. So there's the host tree, then there's the mushroom, and then there's a pseudodomas bacteria, and then there's soil yeasts. So all this has to be in perfect harmony that you can uh, cultivate a, a mushroom which is in symbiosis with the trees. So they brought some br truffles from America to Italy, no, from Italy to America, and tried to to grow those truffles in America, but it was really hard. And I, I'm not exactly like I heard story that that somebody succeeded in this for after 15 years. And then there was this one other guy who who. Also, also succeeded in canterelles, but I will tell you the story when I come come to the uh, techniques of growing mushrooms. And then there's the parasitic mushrooms, which are parasites. So, uh, do, ha, do you know the cordyceps mushroom? Cordyceps. Cordyceps. Do you know I'm it's like highly medicinal mushroom? Yeah. So, called yes. So what what this this cordyceps is doing is uh, uh, I just learned this like a few days ago. So in in the jungle, if there's one species which is like uh, too strong and there's too many individuals of this species, then the cordyceps kicks in. So it's like uh, it infects, for example, the ants, and then the ants get like really dizzy, and they climb up to the tree and to the highest point of the of the tree, and then the the mycelium starts to mummify the ant, and a mushroom pops out of the ant's head, and then it's the spores are spreading around the jungle, and it infects these particular ants which are dominant in the ecosystem. That's the story what I heard. So this would be like a parasitic mushroom which uses the, the host and it kills the host. And our company is, uh, our main product is a parasitic fungi. So okay. we are, uh, there's a medicinal mus mushroom which is called a, a chaga. And it's like the, considered the best medicinal mushroom in the, in, uh, in the world. And this mushroom is growing on birch, so birch, birch uh, betula, uh, betula is like a white tree with uh, with some blacks. Oh, yes. Very common in the north of yeah. of Europe. And uh, 
what we do is we infect the trees with these towels and then after 10 years the forest owner can collect this and uh, sell uh, the chaga on a much higher price than it would sell uh, the cellulosa to the factory. So it's uh, a coming trend, a mega trend coming from Finland that we start to grow this because it only grows in the cold, cold climate. It wouldn't grow here. So this is like our main focus at the moment. And that's a parasitic fungi. But uh, what do you think? Is, is, is it really a parasite? Is it like a... How, how hostile is it for the long-term health of the forest? Do, do you think it's a parasite or is it just natural, like, ecosystem, like, what is it called, progress? Parasite can be good for our ecosystem. Yes. Because other stuff will eat the parasite or yeah. it will arrange, balance. Yes, you're exactly right because there's like this is primarily food. The mycelium and the spores are primary food for for insects, so they come and eat eat you know the the spores. So uh, no one can say tell if it's really harmful for the nature or not. And then there's one more species of mushrooms. It's called the endophytic mushrooms. And those are also partnering with uh, plants like grasses and they go between the cell walls but they don't actually enter the cell walls. And I had some, some example of this somewhere written down. And, and what about Candida? Um, I'm not familiar with, with Candida. Is does anyone know about Candida? No. I don't know if it's a bacteria or a mus mushroom. It's a fungi. Okay. So what about taking a strong fungi against the Candida? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so these en endophytic mushrooms, so they partner with the uh, maize and tobacco. Those are those are the the examples I have. So now maybe the most interesting part for you is like, okay, how the hell do you start to grow these mushrooms? So there's a few techniques. So the most easiest technique, what you do is you, you go to a web store and you order this spawn. This is called the spawn and it's ready made in the laboratory. It's clean. It's strong, everything is ready for, for you, so the only thing is that you get some coffee or any biomass and you, you put this in the biomass. That's the easiest way. So but, biomass, like, uh, like the coffee? Yeah, organic or matter like mate, tea, uh, cardboard, uh, sawdust, banana hulls, anything which is organic. and. Uh -huh. uh, Carbon based, you can use you can use for for growing mushrooms. So as a permaculturist, you always look what's available around, and you pick the resource. Uh, so then another technique is that you if you find a mushroom from the forest, so you take a cardboard, uh, and then you pour some extra hot water like boiling water on the cardboard then you take it carefully with clean hands and you do like this so the excess moisture is out of the cardboard and then you take a piece of your mushroom like on the do you know what the gills are yeah, under, under. The head. so you take yeah. a piece of the gills or the stem like where it touches the earth and you put it between the cardboard and make a sandwich <laughs> So you put the mushroom piece, very small piece, between the cardboard and you make a sandwich. Okay. And then after a week you check and the mycelium has spread on the cardboard. Mm -hmm. So you can cultivate like very low technology like this small... Or, huh? Any kind of mushroom or...? Any kind like from the... you can pick from the forest. But if you take a mycorrhizal fungi, so then it's uh, really hard to 
get it grow. So I would take a saprophytic, which is the tree, like which decomposes dead tree, and not those which pops up uh, besides the tree. Do you understand this? Yeah. The difference? Okay. And then another one is like uh, if you find cantarels from the forest, so you make a spore mass slurry. It's called a slurry. So you add some sugar into this uh, water, like malt sugar or anything, and a little bit of salt. And then you mash the cantarels there, and then you have an ag ugly stick, and you make a soup out of it. And then you wait for a few days, so you see the mycelium starts to grow in this slurry. And then you can pour it everywhere where you want. But this is really like not as efficient than this buying this from the but you can try with this method and another method is that you take a tin foil yeah uh, what do you you know tin foil what do you make a hat if you're afraid of radiation or if aluminium. you aluminium <laughs> so you put a mushroom with the gills down like this and then you wait one day you take it off and you have the spores there and then you fold the tin foil like this and you can store the spores for a long time and then af after that you just need to go you can like collect spores and send them to other other mycologists and when they have a lab laboratory where they can grow them in sterile conditions on these petri dishes so they can start the mycelium from these spores but this is not for home growers because you need equipment for this. And uh, another thing what about this, what you can do is you get some grain more, like this. So you, sp you soak the grain for one day under water or one night. Then you put it uh, to a pot and boil it for two minutes. Then you have a seal and you put them in the seal and you do like this with the seal so the excess moisture comes out of the corn and then you put them in a jar like this make holes on the lid with the knife mm -hmm. and put this micropore tape which is you can buy this from every pharmacy this tape and then it's breathing there so once you have done this preparation of soaking the seeds and boiling them for a few minutes then you put them in these jars and you put them in a pressure cooker for one hour. So you have a 120 degrees for one hour. So it's the, the grain is going to be sterilized. Okay. And then because you don't have a sterile airflow here. So what we used at the Finca in Helder. Uh, we put the oven on. On 250 degrees for half an hour. And then we open the lid from the oven. You know. And then... Uh, we took the jars from the pressure cooker and then we had this and we put a little bit of this in each jar so out of this jar you can make 20 kilos of this with this method so if you want to make and try to sell this over on the island you can make this at home you know with the oven did you understand no <clears throat> so okay i want to reproduce this one yes yeah bigger no so I need to put um, just fresh uh, grain yeah. Um, yeah, and cook it for a minute. No, soak it one night. Soak it one night and then... Cook it cook, cook it, it for one or two minutes. One or two minutes, uh, yeah. And then you put it in the seal. So and then that I, but, but I put it uh, hot or I put it... Uh, hot. You put it hot on the seal. Hot. On the, on the, what is a seal? Seal is like the, when you wash salad, so the excess water drips down. You know when you're ah, washing like a, a sieve. Sieve. Oh, sorry, sieve. So you ah, put it in the like sieve. A, like a colander kind of sieve. thing. Sieve. So you drain the water, and you only keep the boiled. Yeah, and you shake the, the sieve. Uh, thing. You shake the sieve like this, so the excess uh, uh, moisture is gonna evaporate, and then yeah. you have the perfect moisture content for the grain that the the mushroom likes it. Then you put it in, in clean, very clean jars. Very clean jars? Very clean jars. Oh, it's still hot. It's it still doesn't, hot? It, yeah, you can put it still hot, but it, it doesn't matter. Because okay. then you have to put the jars in the pressure cooker. And what I do is I, I put the already this tape on top. 
before I put them in the pressure cooker. So then you have... It needs to be pressure cooker. Yes. If we don't have pressure cooker... Well, no, then you need to get one from eBay, like secondhand, crappy. It works with any pressure cooker. Okay. So then you can produce these 20 kilos with this one jar. Okay, so you put just water in the pressure cooker? Yeah. And then the jars, the, well, this jar... You don't put the water because you, you see, sieve the water out. You just put the grain there. So no water in the jars. No, in the jars, no. But in the jar, you make <coughs> the jars. Um, that I don't want. How, I don't know how you inoculate this one into the new one. Oh, okay. This is like, like you have an oven in your house, right? Yes. So you put the oven on 250 degrees. Uh huh. And then uh, when it's it's been on for 30 minutes, it's sterile. Everything is dead inside the oven. Then you open the lid like this. And you put the jars in front of the oven and then you pour this one to each jar, one tenth like this much to each jar. So the jars empty in front of the oven to sterilize the jars. No, you don't have to sterilize the jars because the jars are one hour in the pressure cooker. So they are already sterile. And then after... But they have been in the pressure cooker before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're in the pressure cooker and then you just lift them and in front of your oven like this, you open the lid and then you take one fifth. So in the pressure cooker you don't have the, the seeds? No, the grain you have there in the pressure cooker, so you sterilize the grain. You have the, the grain by itself, without the thing. Without yes, the, yeah, the yes. Just to sterilize the grain. Yes. yes. Okay, so the, the, the function of the pressure cooker is just to sterilize the grain. Yes. Okay, so once you have the, uh, and, and the jars in the pressure cooker are already ready in, ready in this way, no? That yes. With the holes and with the tape. Yes. Inside the pressure cooker. Yes. Okay, so then you take it off the pressure cooker and then uh, you, you open to mix with a little bit of this. Yes, in front of the oven, so you have a sterile airflow which comes from the oven. Okay. But it's not sterile, but this is the only way like a home grower can do it because you don't have this equipment for getting... Uh, we have the equipment for sterile air, but you don't have. And we did this with Helder yeah. and it worked it, with this technique. We did yeah. 10 jars. I brought one jar from Finland and now Helder has 10 jars like this. What and happens? how long it does it last? This lasts for, like, if you don't want to use it now, you can put it for a half year in the refrigerator and take it out, and in three days it's alive again. <laughs> and then you can use okay, it. Okay, so it, it will last uh, half a year in the, in the yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay, so... But it's not a Ferrari anymore, it's a, like a Skoda. Now it's a Ferrari because it's fresh, but after half a year it's a Skoda. Uh -huh. So you want the Ferrari, right? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Yeah. But you don't have to do it. You, you can like, if you put this in coffee, so once the mushroom has produced the coffee, so then uh, you let it dry a little bit, then you moisten the coffee again and it takes the second flush and maybe a third flush. Flush of what? Flush of mushrooms. So there comes first harvest, second harvest and maybe a third. And then after the third harvest, the mycelium is still in the coffee. So you take it from there and you put it in new coffee. So if you keep the mycelium alive, you can like keep the coffee production running for ages here. The only thing you have to get like new coffee from over there, other side of the street, and you can have a massive uh, oyster mushroom production on this farm. Okay, but we will need always the, uh, the new... So it cannot, the, the coffee cannot be kept for the next day, it needs to be fresh. Yeah, but I went there in the morning and it was still hot, so it's, it's good. And I put the lid on, so it's already pasteurized because they cook the coffee, so the hot water is running through the coffee, so it's pasteurized. So you don't have to pasteurize it again. That's why you need fresh. But if it's two days old, then you take the coffee, you put a little bit of water on the pot, pour everything there, boil it for two minutes, five minutes, and it's pasteurized again. So okay. if you don't have fresh coffee... What, what would happen if, if we um, don't get the Hello. conditions with the oven? No. If, the, if, the, uh, if there's no sterilized air, what would happen? No, there's also, there's like uh, the most famous 
bacteria is the trichoderma mold, the green forest green mold, and it and affect it's everywhere. So it goes into the into the you know the yes. So it would uh, dominate. Yeah, that's why you need to sterilize it. That you don't have to have this uh, forest green mold. Was there anything else? I have something still. Uh, then I have like I want to tell you about. Uh, there was somebody who asked about the medical properties of uh, of the of the mushrooms. So you know, in nature, they have to fight bacteria, virus, and other mushrooms like in the wild. So they have very strong uh, uh, mechanism, defense mechanism for these other mushrooms. And uh, our immune system, it it reacts really strongly to these mushroom sugars which are called the polysaccharides. It's a, a chain of sugars, polysaccharide. And I think the reason why our human body is reacting so strongly to these mushrooms is because we are evolved in, in a fight against mushrooms all the time, like fungal pathogens in the, in the wild, so we fight against them all the time. So when you take, in, in fact, take the mushroom extract, then it starts to fight, fight in your body. So they're used, they're very antibacterial and very antiviral. So they kill bacteria and viruses. So if you have some friend who has a, a disease in the hospital, like a hospital bacteria, which no antibiotic works, then you should definitely go like mush, hardcore mushroom extracting. Like every second hour you take a, a dose of mushroom extract. So it fights the virus. virus. And a good example is with the Paul Stamets. Like his newest research is about the bees. You know, the bee colonies in the world are dying. And there's like already 44% of the bees in uh, America are dead. And... Uh, one third of our diet is like dependent on these pollinating insects. So this uh, Paul Stamets, he was observing nature and he was like, what the hell, the honeybees were eating the mycelium nectar. The nectar is the, the dripping water from the wood, is mycelium nectar. And he was like, why are they eating that? And uh, then the, the bees were so clever that they, they already knew that there's viruses in the nest. So they wanted to like, strengthen their immune system against these viruses. And, it, and then uh, Paul Stamets like, did a test that uh, because it's uh, poor nutrition what the bees get and there's a lot of pesticides and fungicides and herbicides and electromagnetic magnetic radiation which affects the bees so he he put the, in the, the sugar water some mushroom extract of reishi and chaga the ones with which we are providing and 99% uh, of reduction of the viruses in bees 99 percent it's amazing so he's kind of saving the bees with uh, with these mushroom extracts very influential and cool guy mm -hmm. and i noticed it myself because i had a petri dish of of shiitake and there was a strong mold in the corner like this it was like on the petri dish corner and the shiitake was growing and it made a massive wall like this like a wall of China like which surrounded the mold and it, it couldn't like grow anywhere anymore so I experienced this myself that they are very antibacterial and then there's like uh, also like uh, different things what you can do about uh, about mushroom is uh, you can use them as food medicine building materials Plastic replacement, natural dyes. So if you want to dye a sweater or a t-shirt, you can use mushrooms. You can make paper out of them. Leather. You can even make leather out of mushrooms. Wow. Yes. I saw already. Yeah. I saw people what? Really nice. But the coolest thing what I saw is like the newest research actually from Finland. 
is that they use like mushrooms to separate the gold from the old mobile phones. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> that's like the coolest thing. And they can actually also eat radioactivity. Yes, yes, they can. They can take the like 150 times the amount of radioactivity of the background, like radiation. But then, what you should do in Fukushima is that every spring. No, every fall in autumn you have these guys with the suits on and they collect the mushrooms around there and dispose them as radioactive waste. So then you can reduce the amount of, of radioactivity in Fukushima. And they, I think the Japanese invited Paul Stamets over there to solve their problems. I read something about this. what? About like collecting radioactivity with no, mushrooms. No, no, the last part. They, did what? they invited Paul Stamets to to ah, okay, Japan. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Who is yeah. it? Who is it? Yeah, the famous guy. Paul Stamets. Hey. Uh huh. And then you also they they have a test with oil spills. So they have three different piles, everything highly contaminated with oil. One they treat with chemicals, one with uh, I don't remember the second method, and one with mushrooms. So imagine like. The mushroom, the oyster mushroom that we have here, it breaks the organic matter uh, of these carbon-based molecules into less harmful for, for us. And uh, then like, because the mushrooms come there on the, on the pile of this contaminated sawdust of oil, mushrooms come, they rot away, there's a larvae coming, the, 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 the birds come, eat the larvae, they take a crap, on the on the sawdust and the pile of sawdust and soil and after two months there's a thriving ecosystem in there treated with mushrooms like totally contaminated with oil that was also in the book about the mycelium running it's a really cool book uh, after i love to write down the the books yes and then there's the mycopesticide, so you have a problem with pests in your house, like ants. So this guy, he invented like a, like a mushroom, which the ant didn't recognize. It thought it was a sporeless, like it didn't recognize uh, the mushroom and it thought it was like a harm, 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 harmless for them. And it brought them all to their nest and then it started to sporulate and it killed all the ants in the house. And the best thing about this is like it also le left a trace in the house that there was a massive massacre here. Please don't, no, no more ants in this house. So the ants never come to this house again. And today's practice is to spray them with chemicals to get rid of the ants, you know. So you can use this as a natural pesticide. And then there's the for the, the for mycoforestry. So in Finland we have a problem with the uh, with the uh, spruce because when you cut the spruce uh, spruce is a picea abies not uh, uh coniferous a Christmas tree is a spruce pine. Pine. no not pine it's spruce yeah but it's an odd like kind of a family yes tree. so it has this uh, this. Uh, mushroom which spreads through the roots on the soil and underground and infects also like the living spruces so what we do is in Finland we have a, a, a like a liquid which is called rot stop so you have a brush after you cut the, the, the like the spruce you like do like this with the on the stump in the forest and infect another mushroom which fights the, the root rot mushroom this is a general practice in uh, South Finland. So they use another stronger mushroom to fight the pathogenic mushroom which destroys the living trees and it's not good for the timber industry. And of, you know in the, in the CDs they always put these wood chips around the plants. So that's the reason. Do you know the reason why they put in the cities like in every big city in Europe they spread the wood chips under the trees yes, humidity, yeah medicine. yeah and slow release yeah. of nutrition yeah. yes Life in the soil. yes this is very important with uh, when you make a clear cut in the forest that you should do this but it's not done generally in the world and there's like the plant nurseries what we have 
back in uh, Scandinavia, they just use a massive uh, amount of nitrogen to boost the growth of the saplings and then they bring them to the forest. But there's no mycorrhiza, like a partner symbiosis, uh, you know, what is it called? A mushroom, which is in symbiosis with these small saplings, the small plants of trees. So it's a big pro problem. But we, uh, I have an Austrian friend who uh, is my partner now, my, a good friend of me, a very good bass player and, a, and a, a mushroom freak. He's like completely freak. And so he is like, a, he worked in the, in the same uh, company where I went, made my intern mm -hmm. and he's taking care of the production. So he makes everything this and he worked for four years there. And he he made maybe forty thousand petri dishes, and he had one mold one time on the petri dish. So he's and he's twenty eight years old, and he's like the hot, like the most professional dude in Europe, like doing this. And I invited him to come over, and he took over because I was doing everything alone before, and it's a lot of work. Like you have over here, a lot of work. But then I found somebody who partners with me so now I get easy like I do everything else and he does the production and and I don't have to worry about this because I know it's working uh, so I wanna finish this like uh, this like uh, that mycology is just uh, like a young rising brand of uh, science and it's not very known even in the permaculture people they all know how to grow plants, but they don't know how to grow mushrooms. And if you grow plants and mushrooms together in straw on besides your vegetable beds, so they work in symbiosis and you get bigger vegetables. Mm. Oh, wow. So what I what I introduced to Helder in his farm is he has uh, access to straw. A mass like he can get like very cheaply these big straw bales. Yeah. So I said to him like you know the big containers with the one cubic meter, the white ones, what they use in agriculture? You have them everywhere, like what they, you know, the massive ones, the, the big white ones. So I sent him like, okay, ask somebody to take like 10 of those. And then there was some farmer who gave them for free because they're waste. So then they appeared on the ground and then what we, you can do a cold pasteurization process, which means that you have the straw you put it under water for one week, so it kills the aerobic bacteria in the straw. And then when you take it out from there, then you put it on the cardboard and let it get uh, that the excess moisture is gone. So then the, uh, hold on, the aerobic, aerobic. No, anaerobic bacteria will die. So you don't have to use, uh, burn any biomass to heat it up or pasteurize. You can use this cold pasteurization. And then you just take it and when you press the straw like this with your hand, so the perfect moisture is that you have a little bit of moisture on your hand, but not too much. Then you pack it in plastic bags or anything, the straw and inoculate with this. This and then you have them in the plastic. Uh, they use these black plastic bags, the big ones. But as a permaculturist, you could do it also in glass jars or anything sustainable. And then uh, after a month, you just make, uh, with the knife, you make a cut like this. And then it grows from there, the mushroom. So you have these plastic but, bags. But uh, when, when you have put the mushroom? No, you put the, when you have in the, the straw. in the straw, so you put one fifth of this or one tenth of this and spread it around the straw. And then you put it in the plastic bag and wait for one month or six weeks. And then you make the cut, and then you produce the mushrooms. Wow. Only one cut? Only yeah, one cut in I don't know. The there bag. was one guy in uh, who visited, like a mycologist, who is working with, with this in Tenerife. His name is Andrea. He's like 50, 60-year-old, like Italian dude. So he used only one cut. But you can make several cuts, so they come in different places. But if you make one cut, then they come like very big. And the only thing you have to do is you snap it like this. And then you can go anywhere and sell it or eat it yourself. 
So it's it's like a, if you want to start a business in your country about this, it's it's really easy. You just get this, order this for 20 euros, and then you start your production of mushrooms at home. And with this cold pasteurization method, you don't even need a pressure cooker if you use this method. Nice. So we, we could also collect our own straw. Yeah, if you have a farm where you get get straw, this this guy loves straw. The oyster grows really good on straw. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, so and when you there. mix it together, you need to kind of yeah. Do, do you just spread it like, like that, or do you need to really mix it very well? Yeah, because every every grain is a spot where the mycelium starts to grow. Yeah. So the more spread they are, the faster it colonizes the straw. <coughs> okay. So how long they how long they survive without without a refrigerator in this in this jar right now? Uh, this will grow grow a lot now, yeah, and when it's in heat, and maybe it even like if you put this now in the refrigerator and take it out, so after one week it might start to grow mushrooms from here. But you don't want to grow it mushrooms from here because you want to use this as a spawn to inoculate more biomass. No, I just thought about carrying it for three weeks without a refrigerator, so... You can put, uh, if you want, you can take a little bit here and, uh, and pu put it in a mini grip bag and put it in the fridge there, and then you can take it home. Okay, but uh, w when you do, for example, the method of the bags, not to grow it in, with the straw in the, ba in the bags, then how you make this uh, very uh, humid environment? You, you put it as well inside this uh, I don't know if you really need a humid environment because what I experienced, experienced in Finland is because I grow it inside the house in the winter where it's very dry air. So if you find like a spot where there's moisture, so you don't really need this box, but you have to you have to like experience experiment yourself if you need the box or not with the humidity. Because uh, they they prefer the darkness or they don't mind. They prefer the darkness, and but the only thing you, they need a light when they start to grow, but when they grow inside the the coffee, the, it can be complete darkness. They don't need a li light at all. Only when they start to grow the mushrooms. So I will show you now like how. How to spread this into the coffee, so you will see. Yeah. Um, but where is the coffee? Yeah. So like this is very solid, so you have to you have to beat it up like this, because mm -hmm. you want each grain to be separate. If it's really solid, then you need a car tire, and you beat it up on the car tire. But this one is. And then remember, this is very important when you do this. Hey, Papa, no? let's go keskeyttää. No. Me, me katsoo, Papa, mitä teltalle tapahtuu. No. No se lä melkein lähtee lentoon. Oh. Ja me aisen pitää kiinni sitä. Okei, okay, Papa, komme sanoa. Papa vara tvettaa hendenaa, sen komme Papa. Okei. Okay. Okei. Okay. So you need to wash your hands really good, because you don't want anything else to grow go in there. Also up here, so you don't have anything like very clean. Yeah, like really medical clean. Is there a water boiler? You put boiler? some water in, no? So, what I, is, there, is there a water boiler? No, we don't have no. that What happened with the mushrooms? Did you, did you put some water in it? No, I just put a shake it. And then the white gets out? Yeah, it, it, that, it disappears when you shake it, but it's still there. Really? So what I do usually is like... Uh, I didn't know it would disappear. Because there's no water boiler here. So I would boil this even with hot water yeah. to make it like really clean. Yeah. But this, this guy is very strong, so I believe in him. Mm -hmm. And here's the, the thing. So if you want to produce this in commercial scale, you make some holes here, here, and here, and here. With, with, with uh, a, with a yeah. screw, screwdriver. Yeah, or with the drill. Yeah, I mean drill, the drill. drill. And then you put this micro pore tape on top. Yeah. Yeah. Should we do it now? Can we do it now? I don't have micro pore tape, but we can we can do it like this. What I do? No, it has like a for if, oh, for there emergency. Micro pore. No, no, this uh, tape band as, tape. As tape. Uh, we have the flat probably. Thank you so. Do you have, have Yasmin on the flat? Yeah, and, and Thomas, Thomas and Carl went to the flat. 
the charger for. I have some in my... You have it. Yeah. But what, we, what, what I'm doing, right usually it also works like this. I'm yeah. pretty lazy, so I don't want to do it. So I just, I just open it up like this. But this is like a, a chance of contamination. So I leave the lid like this. So it's a little bit open and it can breathe. But if you have the tape, if you can make some holes here and put the tape and have the lid closed and every time you put some more coffee in there, you make sure this one is clean, your hands are clean, everything. So it's safer to have these holes. But now I just demonstrate without the holes, but you know how to do the holes. Yeah. So on the next path you get from the cafeteria, you make the holes, put the lid, no, the, the I, tape there and sterilize. Like I have to do the hole first. Yes, you drill the hole. And then you we wash. We cannot drill now. No, because it's full of coffee. Oh. So, so did you understand like how like next time you make the holes ready? But why do we don't do? We take another bucket like this. We do the drill, do holes. Uh, Daniel has tape. Oh, okay. If you can make a organize a drill yeah. and yeah. some tape. Yeah. So okay. 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 Can you can you bring a, a bucket? And this kind of bucket also, please. Another one. Uh, so big one and okay. small. One. Yes. And we need hot water, very hot water, so we can. So we boil some water. Yeah. I managed this yesterday. Yeah. How how much water? Like just to sterilize this spoon and to uh, to get the hot water, like pour it on this, so this will be so more more. Please.